You can go ahead and be seated while we prepare our hearts for Holy Communion.
exhaling can't you so I want to just do that again I know this is off script but I just I know here we go (laughs) might be complete train wreck that's why I kind of like it I just want to sing that chorus again it's your breath in our lungs can you just lead us in that Ralph and I want us to sing it as loud as we can Joel can you throw the lyrics up there for me chorus two three four it's your breath let's hear in our lungs so we seated. Thanks for singing that out uh, with me. I, I, I tend to sweat when I sing that song because I'm trying to sing with so much force because I love the lyrics. It's your breath in my lungs, and so I'm going to s- praise you only. So awesome, awesome. Well, uh, let me again say welcome to St. Mark's, and uh, if you're a guest with us today, I'm Pastor Paul. We have got a welcome center on your way out, and we've got more information about our church. We'd love to get to meet you there. Also, um, in case you didn't know, everybody, next week is Palm Sunday. I know, I know it's crazy. It's crazy. It's March, right? It's Palm Sunday, so just keep that in mind as you come next week. Don't be don't be weirded out that we're going to hand you palm branches, okay? So we're going to do that next Sunday. 
That means that the week after that is Holy Week, and so I want to just kind of give you a rundown of what's happening that, that Holy Week. First of all, we're not going to have a Maundy Thursday service. Sometimes we have services, sometimes we have a Seder meal, sometimes we do other things. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to spend 12 hours in prayer on Monday, Thursday. One of the things that Jesus does is that he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and prays. And so we want to go there with him this Monday, Thursday. So what I want to just encourage you to do is uh, you can sign up uh, on, on paper out here or you can sign up online, but we'd love for you to take 30 minutes of the day to spend in prayer. Now here's the, here's the catch. We're going to do all this over in the, the Faith Center, Worship Center on the other side of uh, campus here. Um, but you don't have to be present here to do this. So let's say you're at work on Monday, Thursday, like most of us are, and you say, hey, you know, I'm just gonna take one o'clock because I know I can have some time off at that point. You can certainly spend time in prayer there too. Sign up, let us know uh, that you're gonna be spending time in prayer. So uh, we call it nine to nine, Monday, Thursday, March 28th. The next day is Good Friday, Friday which we'll have a service here at seven o'clock in the evening. And then Easter Sunday, it's in your bulletin. You've got lots of opportunities to come and worship on Easter Sunday. So again, Palm Sunday, this Sunday, and then Holy Week comes up after that. All right, well, let me um, remind you of the series that we're going through during the season of Lent. We're talking about scripture passages that we, we got wrong, maybe misinterpreted or misunderstand. And the one today, we actually have right but we forget about uh, an aspect of it. And we're gonna talk about Psalm 23. So will you do me a favor? When I was a kid, uh, I had to memorize Psalm 23, or let me rephrase that. I got to memorize Psalm 23, and we used the RSV version of it. So that's not, that's like an older version translation. And uh, so this is how I memorize Psalm 23, and I'd love for you to speak Psalm 23 with me. Will you say this with me? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I can say this to this very day in Old English, just like this. When's the last time you said preparest and anointest? (laughs) Probably it's been a long time. Uh, this is how I memorize Psalm 23, and like so, uh, so many times, like what we usually do when we think of Psalm 23, we think of Jesus as the shepherd with a sheep on his shoulders carrying us to safety, and that is a good image of Psalm 23. But there's an aspect of Psalm 23 that we just read that we forget about often, and it's the warrior shepherd aspect because what you just read has some warrior overtones to it, which I wanna talk a little bit about today. So here's the deal. As we go through Psalm 23, please don't throw anything at me, because I know we're gonna talk about it a little bit differently, maybe in a way that we don't usually talk about. That's number one. And if you really don't like the message today, what you can do for me, since it's St. Pat's Day, you can Google St. Pat, because I have no idea why he's a saint, okay? So look it up. Tell me afterwards, and uh, I'll be fascinated by it in my green shirt. All right, Psalm 23. How we get this one somewhat wrong is we ignore the warrior part. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There is this aspect of being a warrior that we forget. The shepherd had to be brave as much as they had to be skillful because they faced enemies every day. The most famous shepherd in the Bible outside of Jesus as our Lord and shepherd is David. And this is an old picture book, picture book um, image of David slinging that stone and knocking down that nine-foot Goliath, that ugly, hairy goon of a Philistine. 
and he was a beast. His armor weighed more than what most people weighed. And David, being the shepherd that he was, he also was this warrior shepherd because he had to fight off wild beasts and wild animals, possibly mountain lions, possibly wolves, maybe even bears. He had to fight them off. And so, of course, when he hears that the Philistine Goliath is threatening the armies of Israel, he comes out and says, I could take this guy out. I, I got this. He's just like an overgrown bear. And whenever you think of a grizzly bear, you know how they get on their hind legs? It's not a good sign, right? That's kind of like Goliath. And so he takes a sling and a rock, and just like he had battled other enemies when he was being a shepherd, he battled Goliath. I like to think of David as a warrior shepherd because we know as David uh, later on becomes king, he is a pretty awesome warrior, actually. In fact, just as a side note, sorry, uh, when I get on side notes, it goes poorly. But I like the fact that David here is buff, okay? Like he's got muscles. This is what a shepherd would look like. He's not sitting in front of his TV watching NFL football, you know, eating popcorn and drinking beer on St. Paddy's Day, right? This is not what he's doing. He is constantly moving and constantly picking up sheep, and he's just buff. I also like to think of Jesus as buff. I know that's weird. But he was a carpenter, and that means that he was constantly lifting and hauling things. In fact, most of his work was probably not with wood. It was probably with stone because there wasn't a whole lot of wood in Israel in that day. So he was probably working on mosaic floors and buildings that were made out of stone. So you got to be buff. Everybody say buff. buff. Ooh, that was good. That was good. <laughs> that was good. So when I think of a, a shepherd, uh, I certainly think of David, and I think of Jesus, and I think of these warrior shepherds. Now, let me just, before I get into the aspect of being a warrior, let me just give what I call the shepherd disclaimer, okay? And it's this, about four months ago, I was given a document uh, from a friend who, um, which, which basically outlines Psalm 23 as a, an entire uh, psalm about just being a shepherd. And so I wanna just make this disclaimer that you can definitely read Psalm 23 all as a shepherd. Let me just share quickly uh, what, what this document shared. It basically said that Psalm 23 is basically the, the, the day in the life of a shepherd in Israel. So in the morning, the shepherd takes the sheep to green pastures. Early in the morning before the sun comes up, the shepherd is moving the sheep to green pastures. They graze there. Once they're done grazing, the shepherd takes them to still waters. Now, it was never still like we think of in Iowa ponds, right? It was not like it was always moving water. Sheep liked the moving water, but they were, it was a still creek, right? Just gently moving. And so that was the next place that they go, and that restores their soul. And so the shepherd first feeds them, then brings them to water. The problem is, is that most of the water was in valleys. And so the shepherd would have to lead the sheep down a valley to where the water was at. And when you're down in the valley, that's a dangerous place to be because that's where the wolves gather as well. That's where the lions gather as well. In fact, shepherds in the Middle East, when they think about Psalm 23, they think specifically of a narrow passage down the side of the valley. And apparently, shepherds in the morning would go one direction down that uh, narrow path, and it was literally wide enough just to hold a sheep across it. And in the evening, they'd go up another direction. And apparently, if you went the wrong direction on a one-way street, there were a lot of problems. And so the shepherds understood that they're leading them through this valley of the shadow of death. But a shepherd carries a rod and a staff, which we're gonna talk about uh, with him. And so then finally, at the end of the day, the shepherd brings the sheep into the pen or wherever they're gonna be staying for the night. And interestingly, uh, what this document said is that the shepherds would take their staff and they'd put it in front of the sheep gate, and as the sheep came through, they would pick off the briars or the, the, the needles that had poked them or had damaged them, and then they would take oil and put it on those spots that had injured the sheep. And so you read, you know, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, that's the pen even though enemies are all around, and you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. 
So it's interesting, I received this document that kind of talked about Psalm 23 as the day in the life of a shepherd. And I just want to tell you that's, that's the shepherd disclaimer, okay? That if you look at Psalm 23 and you hear what I'm about to tell you and you say, now, Pastor Paul, not a warrior shepherd, just a shepherd, I'm perfectly fine with that. Can we agree on that? Okay. You ready to get to the warrior side? Of course you are. Come on. We're going to get to the warrior side of the shepherd. All right. What's interesting is that in the Old Testament and the New Testament, what you read about our God is that our God is the shepherd of Israel. But our God is not just a shepherd who is this peaceful and easy to get along with shepherd. Our God is this warrior shepherd that goes after the sheep, that defends the sheep of Israel. And the New Testament, Jesus is that shepherd. And anybody who's not one of his sheep, he knows that. But he goes and he finds the lost sheep. And in fact, at the end of the entire Bible, Revelation talks about Jesus coming down from heaven, being the warrior king who leads his people in battle so that they will win the final battle of all time. And so this idea of Jesus as shepherd and God as shepherd is also God and Jesus as warrior. And we see this specifically in the psalm in a couple ways. The first way is this. The Lord uses a rod and a staff to protect. A shepherd always carried two things with them, a staff, which is, you know, we can think of a staff, and then a rod. This might have been what they looked like. Staff, we can understand that. Sometimes they had a, a hook on them, and, you know, we would understand that the shepherd would, you know, kind of take the neck of the sheep, and if the sheep was going the wrong way and he wasn't listening, you stubborn sheep, stubborn, stubborn, finally you have to use that hook and say, get over here this way, or maybe a sheep had fallen into a crevice, they take that hook, they pick up the sheep. We understand that really well, but the rod, this short, heavy, club-like device, was used to attack enemies. So when the psalm says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me, the way the sheep are comforted is to know that they have a warrior shepherd who's got that rod. Uh, many years ago, I went to Kenya and I visited the Maasai Mara people. The Maasai Mara people use rods. And this is an example of what one looked like. I actually, I actually traded for one of these rods from a Maasai Mara person. I had bought a Target, uh, you know, like $5 electric watch, you know, kind of one of those digital electric watch. What is that called? A <laughs> digital watch, you know, just, just a $5 cheap thing, right? He was so enthralled with it, he said, let's trade. And I thought, man, this is a good deal for me. So let's definitely trade. So uh, we traded for it, and I brought home this rod. And it looked pretty much like this. And I can tell you that it was made of strong olive wood. It was made of hard wood. And I can tell you that when you swung that thing, you could feel the impact of the end of the rod. And you could tell this was not a, a toy to be messed with. Of course, my boys did mess with it, and I didn't realize that it was behind my car, and so I backed over it and split it in two. So I don't have it anymore. It's, it's not that sad. But, you know, it, it was a cool prop to come on Sunday morning. Hey, you know, here's my rod. Uh, so this is what uh, shepherds would use, and literally it's used to club your enemy or to throw it at your enemy. It was a warrior's weapon. And so when we think about a shepherd, the shepherd was also there to protect us. And the Lord uses that rod and that staff to protect us from our enemies. Do you know how often the Lord protects you every day? I, I know we don't think about that very often in modern America, because we think that seat belts protect us and smoke detectors protect us and all the other electronic things that protect us, and uh, we have airbags protect us, and those things do protect us. But how often in our day-to-day -day lives is God protecting us from things we don't even know? I told you that I learned the RSV version of Psalm 23 when I was a kid. I also was listening to a lady named Amy Grant. Does anybody remember Amy Grant? There's a song that she sang back then that talked about angels watching over me and God's protection. And that she, in that song, she shared stories about, you know, driving her car and how 
that she avoided an accident, but that was angels watching over her. That was God protecting her. We forget about that way too often. We think that we protect ourselves. But I have countless stories that people tell me that their protection devices have failed, yet they were saved, they were spared. This is our God at work in our lives. Our God is a God who protects us, and Psalm 23 reminds us of that. In fact, not only protects us, but goes to battle for us. So, the Lord is a warrior shepherd because he has a rod and a staff. The Lord's a warrior shepherd because the Lord celebrates in victory with us. Um, Interesting thing about the psalm, when you talk about preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies, that that is like uh, a verbiage that describes what what ancient kings would do when they won a battle. If, If they brought home prisoners of war, what they would do is they would shackle them and they would lead them in procession like a parade, it was very humiliating. And they would take their enemies and lead them out while they were celebrating and having a feast. So literally, the, the men were celebrating their victory while their enemies were being paraded and, and, and mocked. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Our Lord is a warrior shepherd who basically says, come to my table while I'm taking care of your enemies which is exactly what you did today. This is called the Lord's Supper, and we invite people to come to the table. This is a feast of victory. Your cup overflows. Imagine if your cup overflowed in communion every Sunday. That would be problematic, but that's what they did when they celebrated. Jesus, when he leads his disciples into this Passover meal, which was a celebration, He said, this is my body and my blood. I've given it for you as your shepherd warrior. Now celebrate it with me. I know often we just think, oh, this is remembering what Jesus did for us. Certainly it is. But it's also a victory meal for us. One of my my favorite songs, we don't sing it here. It's kind of a modern song. But it's called, uh, This is How I Fight My Battles. It's one of those songs that just repeats over and over. So if you don't like repeating songs, don't listen to it. But I love it, because it goes, this is how I fight my battles, this is how I fight my battles. And when you get to a verse, it says, I fight my battles at your table, Lord. You actually don't go out and fight anything. You sit down, because he's done the fighting for you. You sit down and you celebrate. And when you read Psalm 23, that's what you move to, this warrior celebration. You've prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This morning, we ate in the presence of our enemies. While they might be outside of this wall, while they might be invading us as we leave this place, in this place, this is a feast of victory. We call this a sanctuary because it's a place of protection. It's a place where we gather and where we receive the good things of God. Now, let me just quantify that real quick. Your enemies are not your neighbors. Please don't go home and look at your neighbors and say, that's my enemy, Pastor Paul said. No, your enemies are the spiritual forces of this world. That's what the Apostle Paul said. Your enemies aren't the people that you see every day that don't look like you or think like you or vote like you or whatever. We get that completely wrong. Your enemies are the spiritual forces that you're battling against, the spiritual forces that are tempting you, the spiritual forces that are trying to divide you and separate you from the shepherd warrior, the spiritual forces that are trying to get you to hate your neighbor because then they've got you in their grasp. So the Lord celebrates in victory with us. He's a warrior shepherd who says, come and and eat of this feast because it is good. And finally, in Psalm 23, the Lord is a warrior because the Lord specifically anoints me as his own. When you would celebrate this victory, often there would be oil there, and the commander, the king, would anoint his soldiers in victory. He would say, you are mine. Here's the oil of life for you. You're my chosen few. You anoint 
my head with oil. My cup overflows. The shepherd warrior has chosen you, has said, you are mine, you are my sheep, you are part of my kingdom. And he anoints you. I find it really interesting that anointing also moves its way into the Gospels. And you might remember that Jesus was anointed by a sinful woman. She anoints his feet, not his head, with oil and perfume, and she dries them with her hair. It's because she understands what anointing means. Anointing in that scenario was preparing him for his death, but it was also marking him out. It was saying that this person is unique because not only is he our shepherd, he's our warrior. He's the one that's gonna go fight our battle. He's the one that's gonna die for us so that we might have freedom and life and liberty, that we might be the people that he's called us to be. This is our warrior shepherd. And so when we think about the Lord as our shepherd, when you read Psalm 23, in my opinion, you just can't leave out the warrior part. He's got a rod and he's got a staff. He prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He anoints your head with oil, your your cup overflows. And then finally, it says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. That verse, follow me, is not what it actually means. It means surely goodness and mercy will chase me all the days of my life. It's not a passive thing. It's a chase type of idea. The Lord is running after you. You're a lost sheep, and he's running to you to save you. This is what it means every day of your life. And so I I took this from a a lady who wrote a commentary on Psalm 23. She describes it as fierce tenderness. I like that. I like that a lot. The Lord as shepherd warrior as fierce tenderness. It's, It's like he's running after you, and you get scared because you know you've gone to the wasteland, you know, like Simba does in The Lion King. And you, you're so desperate because you're surrounded by hyenas, and what you need to hear is the roar of Mufasa. Right? Mufasa, yeah. That, that's what you need, and it's fierce, and Simba's thinking to himself, oh my goodness, I'm so in trouble. But at the same time, he's thinking, thank God my dad is here. Or if you like the lion theme, you can take C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's Aslan coming to the, to the rescue of the kids. This is our warrior shepherd. He's pursuing us with fierce tenderness. He's chasing after us. And if you get caught, his anger only lasts for a moment. But his loving kindness endures through generations. This is the kind of shepherd warrior that we have, fierce and tender. Jesus does this all for you. There's nothing that I want you to take from this message to go home and do or to even, you know, practice. I just want you to be a sheep this morning. It's okay. It's all right to go home and just say, bah. It's okay. I just want you to know that you've got a shepherd who's a warrior who is chasing after you. And when you see him running to you, maybe try not to run away, right? Even though he's fierce, his love is tender. I want to end on one last thing. The Apostle Paul, in my opinion, uh, takes up this idea of the Lord as a a warrior in Ephesians, and he he talks about how our strength is not our own, but it's found in Jesus. Too often, sheep think their own strength is going to lead them to waters, or it's going to restore their soul. And so Paul writes in Ephesians 6, this passage that we don't often talk about, but but it's so powerful. He says, finally, after everything he said in Ephesians, he says, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against what? The devil's scheme. The devil, that, that lion that wants to devour you, not the good lion, 
but like Mufasa's brother, right? I, I'm just telling you, all Disney movies that we love are ultimately based on Jesus, okay? Let's just, let's just make that claim. Paul goes on to say, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Which, those are forces that you cannot overcome by yourself. You need a warrior shepherd to defend you. So today I just want you to be a sheep and let the Lord defend you. By the way, this idea of rod and staff, you see a rod often in your life. You probably just don't realize it. It looks something like this. You ever seen this symbol before? That's a rod right there. It's what it's meant to be. It doesn't have the little head on it, but that's what it's meant to be. It's the rod of Asclepius. It's a Greek legend. Asclepius was the god of healing, and so what they would do is when they created temples to Asclepius, they would have a rod there, and then they would have snakes there, non-venomous snakes, by the way. That would be bad to go to a place of healing and get bit by a snake, which, by the way, it's spring break this last week, and so we started watching uh, Indiana Jones with our older son. When he falls in that pit where all the snakes are at, I, that's hard for me to handle. So this is the symbol that we have, and it's the symbol of emergency medical services. You know the people that chase after you when you're in trouble? The people that pursue you when you need help? Way before Asclepius was ever an idea, there was a different rod that was lifted up. It was in the desert with the Israelites because they were surrounded by snakes. And Moses lifted up this rod and he put a bronze snake on it and anybody who looked at it would be saved. About 1,500 years later, Jesus is lifted up on a rod. He's lifted up on a piece of wood. It's called a cross. And we know that everyone looks, that who looks to him will be saved. Our shepherd warrior who went to battle that night of Maundy Thursday against the devil who is tempting him. That shepherd warrior who went to battle against the Roman forces and the Pharisees' goons and against Pontius Pilate, but he didn't go to battle in the way we expected him to. He didn't raise up an army. Instead, he laid down his life. He went to battle on the cross, and the forces of evil were defeated, even though it looked like he was the one who died. Jesus is the one who ran to our aid in those moments. And three days later, when he rose from the dead, everything became apparent to us. We realized he is that shepherd warrior who is victorious. He is the one who is chasing after us. We are the sheep in his pasture, the ones he loves. And so today, I just want you to rest in that, especially as we prepare for next week. As we come to Palm Sunday, we're going to have this victory this next Sunday with palm branches. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be exciting. And then everything's going to come crashing down on the story. But we know this is not the end for our warrior shepherd. We know it's just the beginning that he is coming after us. He's chasing us. He's pursuing us every day. And we just get to be his sheep. That's a good thing. When you read Psalm 23, it's a good thing to have that kind of warrior shepherd. We stand, let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for being our warrior shepherd. Thank you for never backing down to the evil forces in our world. Thank you for pursuing us, chasing us because we know your goodness and mercy is exactly what we need as sheep. Lord, Lord, help us to just bask in your care and your kindness. In our anxious and hurried world, where we're constantly trying to hedge off our enemies or constantly trying to prepare for the next battle, help us just to come to your table 
and to know that we are victorious and to celebrate with you and just to be at peace with you, God. Thank you for pursuing us. Thank you for giving us your life so that we might have life. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for being our warrior shepherd. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, with it being St. Patty's Day, we thought it would be appropriate to end our service with a Gaelic blessing. This is the song, God be with you till we meet again. You may not know it, but um, it might be one of those songs where you put an arm around a family member or open up your hands and just receive. Let's sing together. God's blessings to you this week as you connect faith and life. We hope to see you next Sunday for Palm Sunday. Have a great week.